take copper pin, and all they do is literally, if you've got a house like that, and you want, you've got a line running through the middle, and you put a pin on one side of the house on the outside, and a pin on the other, um, and it grounds out the line. Um, and that's basically what sort of what they do. So I did this, and I took out these two lines that crossed. I didn't say any. I talked to my mother. I didn't talk to my dad. My dad's a scientist, no interest whatsoever in dowsing or anything, anything like this. And uh, about a week later, um, they started saying my feet have really sorted themselves out. You know, and Mum and I laughed a lot. Uh, we did tell him a couple of years later, and he still doesn't get it. But you know, his feet stopped being hot. And um, it just. That was the start of me learning to explore how our, how our Earth's natural energy system worked. Um, in the process of looking around the house, I went out into the garden. Oh, let's find another inverted commas energy line. And uh, I found one that ran across the front of the garden. And I thought, so I tried, got the pins again, made some more, because they're only just, these are just bits of copper wire. Uh, I made the pins again, but this time I put them quite close together and effectively made a little gate. And what that meant was, if the line was running down here, if you went there where you doubt it was, you get a response of something was going on. And if you went that side, something's going on. And before you put the pins in, something's going on in the middle. And then you put the pins in, and you don't get a response in the middle. So the rods just go through. Um, two years ago, when I did a talk here, uh, right at the end, there was a German uh, scientist that came in who had a, a multi-wave oscillator, uh, which basically is a, it's about, it was about the size of a half a credit card. And um, this thing locks on to whatever electromagnetic signal isn't there. Okay? So uh, and the great thing was right at the end of the talk, and he pulled it out of his pocket, and he just chucked it in the middle, and it null and voided the pins. All right? It was brilliant. And, so, and I went through, and then I got a response as well. Um, at that point, I taught my mum to doubt. She was like, oh, you know, so effectively, you would f you'd have a little gate that you could walk through. And then you take the pins out, and again, you get a response right away down the line. Just because I was interested, at that point, um, I took a rock. And if the line was running in front of me, I put the rock on the line, and I went round it, and all of a sudden I found that the line would go actually around the rock, like that. I thought, well, that's pretty cool. Um, the next bit is when it started to get a lot more interesting. And I picked the rock up, and I turned the rock over, and I put it on the other way up. Okay, now this rock isn't going to balance that way up, but you know what I'm saying. So I put the rock on the other way up, and it went the other way around the rock. You put it that way up, it'll go one way around, turn it over, and it'll go the other way around. It's like, ah. I then wondered, well, if you got, if I'm getting a response of something in front of me, you know, this slight fluctuation, you know, energy line, um, if it had a direction, so I, I went in with the dowsing rods, has it got a direction? And the rods all went to one side. And I thought, oh, oh and that's, that's interesting, but I didn't know any more than that. And um, what changed things for me was actually going out that night and I asked the same question again, has it got a direction? And the rods went the other way. So it's got a diurnal characteristic, which means it goes one way during the day and the other way at night. And at that point, I googled diurnal characteristics. And um, all of a sudden, I found out that these energy lines, in inverted commas, actually had a name. They had been studied by science um, for the last at least, uh, at least 150 years they've been studying them um, and they're actually called telluric currents um, it is part of the earth's electromagnetic field um, and they're basically um, very low voltage between one to one and a half volts um, and you can measure these with little voltmeters in the ground uh, the original earth batteries um, that people like Nathan well Nathan Stubblefield invented them um, but the original earth batteries were again you have two um, dissimilar metal probes in the ground uh, and you can pick up a very very small uh, amount of voltage in, in that. Um, it was actually used uh, to help power the American railroad system uh, at first because all they needed was a tiny little amount of electricity. But then as, as modern electrics came in, Tesla as most of you know but probably invented the, well did invent the, the AC motor, 
Um, so we weren't using direct current because obviously direct current will just kill you sort of thing. So AC is safe. So, uh, and then modern electrics came into being and these, this tiny amount of effectively what became uh, useless power, uh, the, the research in it got left behind and because we moved into the modern age. Uh, and so we went on. Um, right. The reason when I placed the stone on the line, it went round in one direction, and then I turned it over, it went round in the other, is all to do with what's actually called a paleomagnetic signature. Um, all rocks, uh, doesn't matter what type, uh, whether they're sedimentary or igneous, have a... Um, a very small uh, particles of metallic elements in them. So you get, you know, gold, iron, copper, you know, but very small amounts. And when the rocks are first formed, um, i.e. sort of when they're molten, now I'm talking millions of years ago, those particles align themselves to the magnetic north pole. Okay? Now, obviously, over millions of years, uh, with geology, the formations change. The, you know, when, when the rocks come out of the ground... Um, they're not obviously all these little bits are facing north, um, and it's down. That creates a polarity in the stone. Um, the first stone circle um, that I helped to build, and I provided the rock for that, was at Sunrise Festival uh, four. I think it was about four, no, probably five years ago now. And I approached Sunrise because I had I wanted to find out stuff. You know, oh, let's let's get some rocks. Let's build a stone circle. So I approached Sunrise and I said, look, I'd like to build you a temporary stone circle. Uh, I'll turn up with an articulated lorry, all the rocks, put them in, you have the festival and the quarry gets them back. But I went to the quarry um, just down the road from Bruton. Uh, Rob, I've worked with on numerous occasions subsequently now. Um, and I went to the quarry with a little compass um, and I watched... Because these are sedimentary rocks, right? This is a, um, a sandstone that we used, and it's sedimentary, so it's it's formed by layers and layers and layers that build up very slowly over time. So you haven't got all the volcanic processes with an igneous rock that makes so that makes all the you never know they're not going to be facing magnetic north. But these the rocks were coming out the cliff in sort of a horizontal direction, and it was north to south. And you could go in the dowsing rods, and at one end of the rock. The rods would flow to one direction, at the other end, it would flow to another. And if you turn the rock over that way, you'd get the opposite response. So I then realised that obviously, yes, there is a polarity uh, to the stones um, that we can actually detect uh, with the rods. Um, right. Okay. I then wondered. Um, if you had a line, um, whether or not you could move it. So I'll take, I'll use the same rock just for the sake of illustration, but I'll put the rock on one side of the line and I'll put two rocks on the other side of the line like that. Um, and I actually moved the line. Okay. So again, I got a response with the dowsing rods here and a response here, but when you go into the middle you get no response until you actually get to the end. And you can trace it like that around. The really interesting part is, um, and I have before, and I will have some things to properly show you in a moment. Um, the interesting thing was that normally I'll get somebody else just to pick the rock up, and you pick the rock up, and at that point the line springs back to its original position. So it's actually, it, it's like it's elasticated. Okay. Um, I think we'll have a slide. I'm a, yeah, we'll have a slide. Have a little bit of a slide. Right, I'm um, I'm a craftsman. I don't even know how to start this. I work with stone. Um, my talk is, like I said, called Machines of the Ancients because of the group. Um, I've also, I'm developing a new talk, which is the art of the ancient geomancers. Because what I'm interested is in, um, when people mention the word ancients, um, it, it, it's, it's too removed, okay? Thousands of years ago, the only, the, 
the only thing we had to work with on our planet to do anything was, was the Earth itself. Um, over the years, there has been a succession of people that have opened up the world of geomancy and, and dowsing. Um, I mean, you started off with Jean-Michel, into Hamish Miller, um, Paul Broadhurst. So all these people have been interested in the Earth mysteries and trying to discover what are our ancients, what were the ancients up to. These ancients are our ancestors. They're not some million miles away people, right? They are our flesh and blood that just knew how and what could be done on the planet, okay? Um, I work with stone. Um, I do big hard landscaping. I am a stone mason. Um, I'm not a qualified stone mason, but I do work with rocks all the time. Uh, and I've been lucky enough over the last few years to to glean a little bit more of an understanding of what our ancestors used to do. Um, because I was down in Dartmoor at the time, and I went out onto Dartmoor, and I started looking at, I was getting uh, basically a like series of lines as I walk along. So I'd walk along, I'd get a response, and you'd go up and down it, and it was a line, and then I'd walk about another 10 or 15 foot, and there was another line. When you walk down the lines, they would just go on. There was no grid as such that I was picking up, they were just lines. But this, don't forget, is the middle of nowhere. Um, I've been all over to fields, um, basically all over this country and in Ireland, and again, you just get these series of lines, again, 10, 15 foot apart. Um, I was obviously intrigued uh, about this, and I found out that, that there is a centre line and on either side, there's two lines either side that are the same. So if the centre line is flying in one direction, on either side of that line, almost like an eddy, is another very slight variation flowing the other direction. Outside of that is another and another. And in most completely natural untouched places, you seem to get a centre line with four on either side. So it's basically a band of nine. Um, certain places like Mount Edgemoon and Plymouth, there's actually seven but that's because two of them have actually been used already. And I will explain exactly what I mean by that you know, in a moment when I talk about the stone circle that we built for them as well. In certain places, um, and what surprised me is as I was walking across Dartmoor, um, all of a sudden I found a, a huge gap. So I was getting a, a very regular response, you know, response, line, response, line, response, line. And I did walk across miles and miles, to, you know, and it was generic, just very gently across the whole surface. But in one place, they'd got, and there was nothing, there was nothing there. And I, I carried on walking, and eventually what I found, and if you sit up a little bit, you can see, but basically what I found was four rocks on the ground. And there was a big rock, as I walked down the hill, there was a rock at the top, and I was walking across here, and there's regular line, regular line, regular line, and then they've got... And I walked down to the bottom of the hill and I found there was four rocks and all of the lines were basically in between these four rocks. Just the other side of those um, is a stone circle called yellow mead. It's uh, three concentric rings uh, right there. Um, it's, it, it, there's no signpost for it or anything like that. It is marked on an OS map. Um, and I knew it's somewhere around there, you know, but I'd... I couldn't find any, I didn't get any response in the middle of the circle at all, at all. So I had all this, the rods when I was going across this bit were literally pinging. They were like, pew, 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 like that as I went across. And they actually fanned out uh, in, a, in a kind of classic shape, they curved back round. Um, but there was nothing in that circle. I couldn't work out why until I actually looked it up, Yellow Meadstone Circle, and I found out it was one of those, like a great many, uh, in this country and abroad, because stone circles are found all over the world, um, that had been restored by very helpful Victorian archaeologists. So a Victorian archaeologist comes along and sees a stone that's fallen over, and he picks up the stone and he puts it upright. And when we see stone circles, even like Avery, Stonehenge, they've all been rebuilt. Stonehenge has been rebuilt three times. You know, it's got a massive great slab of concrete in one of the stones. So at the moment, this very helpful Victorian archaeologist has picked a stone up. The, whatever 
was done has has this it's the elastic is sprung back if you go to places like um stanton drew in one part of stanton drew as you has anybody been to stanton drew stone circle probably quite a lot of people um and i haven't actually felt this myself but a couple of friends of mine have there's one place where your fingers go numb for some reason you just walk in there and your fingers go numb and i've doused stanton drew myself uh and you have got these sort of wavy sort of energy lines. I'm still call I'll call them energy lines for the sake of, but they are telluric currents. Um, and they kind of want it, but then they go around a stone. Actually, I'll change things around a little bit so you can see. So if there's two stones, there's a line that came in, I followed it, and it went round the stone, it looped around, and it went off the stone. Now, for the lines, when you're in the field, you get in a regular, regular occurrences, so all of a sudden, find that these lines have been wrapped around rocks. We were doing something to our electromagnetic field thousands of years ago that we have now forgotten how to do. It's as simple as that. Um, and there are, there's a few people dotted, I've got, the reason I set the group up was I had all this information as such and, and interest in it and I wanted somebody or at least Google to explain it to me. You know, what on earth? What on earth is it? I want to understand this. There must be somebody out there studying this. So I set up machines of the ancients, and I kept asking, 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 and I just wanted I wanted people to come in so I could learn from them about what they thought this was. And I found out that for some reason I was sort of one of the only people that was actually interested in this, really to this level of of trying to understand what what we used to know how to do, what our ancestors used to do. They built stone circles and stone rows and standing stones all over the planet. And they've all been doused and they all find all these energy lines you know, rotating off them, coming off them. You've got um, grids that came in, like the, the Hartman grid. Um, you've got the Beth Hagen's grid, the Curry grid. And now these days you have a lot of people because obviously as technology is advanced, so you go on Google Earth and you can press a button on your little computer on Google Earth and you can find uh, a series of sacred sites dotted throughout the world that all are on a line. Uh, if anybody wants to find ley lines, then they go on to the magical ley line locator and you can look that up and what you can do, you type in your personal postcode and uh, magically you will have a ley line that runs through your house. Now, the reason that works, very, very simple. This was based on uh, a work who, of a chap who's actually a comedian who set up the Woolworth line. And the Woolworth line is basically if you take certain locations of Woolworths, as they were the shop, uh, and it will create a line. So you have the Woolworth line. He set this thing up because basically all it does, it will take a whole map of England and somewhere on that map it plots your house and it finds an alignment of Churches, Hills, Sacred Sites. So you've got a magic ley line. Um, it's, a, it's a funny little game. Do try that one at home. Um, we've all had throughout history different names for these energy lines. Um, the Chinese called them dragon lines. Um, thousands of years ago, these lines were, they are electrical currents. They were a currency. They were used... Um, by our ancestors uh, for some reason and I'm going to get to that right at the end of the talk because that's a bit where you're all going to think it kind of makes sense but um, right right I've forgotten where I was now bear with me okay They just link back. If you imagine out, are you talking about the, the yeah, four the rocks? These rocks were rub, pulled down. And circled around. Ah, oh, how is it circled around? Yeah. Okay. Do you have to rotate one around the other? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. You put one there and you go, Okay. I didn't know that back then, but you know. Um, 
Right, energy lines. Let's get a little bit cleared up. And ley lines. Ley lines, energy lines, there is a massive confusion between anybody and most people about what things are. I, I've just come back from Mount Edgecombe where I built a stone circle for them. And uh, the, the I have I do now work with uh, a chap called um, Stuart, good friend of mine, down on Dartmoor, whenever we hook up sort of thing. And the reason we work together well, uh, we're both dowsers, um, the trouble with dowsing is that everybody has a slightly different response. Uh, there was some work done by a chap called Rory Duff, who's the head of the Bristol Dowsing Association, uh, a few years ago, and, and they took, um, uh, I'm just going to keep calling it an energy line because it's easier, but they had an energy line and they, uh, between a few of them, you know, recorded their responses looking for the same line. And they found out that, you know, Rory would get a response, say, 10 foot from the line, where another friend of his would get a response 20 foot from the line. They're measuring the same line, but because they are a very slightly different frequency, they were, and this is, they're a very sensitive instrument, um, you get a very slight different response. Stuart and I work really well together because we've found out we actually get a very similar response. So we've been out and looking at the Michael and Mary line, for instance, and we'll both pick up where the Mary line is. We, we went around Brent Tour uh, recently with that. So you have what are called ley lines. Um, out down at Mount Edgecombe, I work with Stuart, I also work with the estate manager, Nick, uh, who is also a dowser. Um, and they both, they were calling them ley lines. These are very, they're just little fluctuations in the ele electromagnetic field, okay? A ley line is a term that's come into use that has, it has confused the issue. These energy lines are telluric currents. It's as simple as that, that's what they are, okay? Um, and again, Google it, look it up, it's all out there, all right? Um, Alfred Watkins wrote a book in the 20s, uh, which is absolutely superb. Um, now, I remembered as I was an adult that I actually read it when I was about 15. And it, he, he was a guy um, who basically walked and uh, walked around the country and he was finding, um, as he walked around, there was a lot of places that ended in Lee. Okay. Now, I actually live near Glastonbury. There's a village near me called Butt Lee, L-E-I-G-H. And he would find that these series of little towns and little villages all ended up in a, in a line. So the word, as we term L-E-Y, lay line, came from Alfred Watkins saying Lee line because it was villages on top. And then as we started to get maps and rulers and you could draw a line and it would link it all up. Um, Hamish Miller... Um, Hamish Miller um, basically found or was looking at the Michael and Mary line, which are, uh, are two energy lines uh, that basically twist down the country from uh, Suffolk right the way down to St Michael's Mount. Uh, and the Michael line is you know, fairly straight, and then the Mary line wiggles around it. Um, at each of those little wiggle points, they're called nodes. And uh, a lot of people, are, stone circles are built on nodes you know there was this magical node that suddenly appeared in the ground and stones were put on the node the node wasn't there until we put the node there that's the whole point out in the fields regular lines stone circles something different happened we did that all right so um a friend of mine who's not sitting a million miles away from me decided that um if you do want to really study the Michael and Mary line, you can actually go online uh, and you can actually buy the maps. Uh, and there are a series of maps, and I think there's about, how many are there? 42. There you go, 42. <laughs> and you have to buy each of them individually. Well, you can buy uh, like a Cornwall sat or a Devon sat. Yeah. So there's a series of maps that go up the country. Um, everybody regards the Michael and Mary lines, big long currents of line, and that's it. You know, what you do find out, if you did buy all of the maps, and if you did then pass those maps on to a friend of yours to transpose onto current OS maps and actually get a full path, you'll realise there's really big gaps between them all. Okay, so they don't actually know that it all does link up, but we regard it as all linking up. Um, I thought that was quite fun. Oh yeah, one little thing about the Mary line, um, and you'll like this, we <laughs> I did this with Stuart on Brent Tour. Uh, we had the line in front of us, okay, and I was sort of up this end, 
And all I did, I did the same thing with the two rocks, all right? But I did it like that. And I moved the rock over there, so we had that formation, and he was about 50 foot away up there. Um, and I lifted up the rock, and his rods up here, where he was on the line, opened up. So they op opened up as I lifted up, and that sprang back. You know, like a guitar string? And, you and it sends up down there. And he, pick he picked it up, so he was there with the line. And then as my wave came past him, his rods went, Neow! opened up and closed again. So, uh, in a possible sense, it would be possible to send, well, you could send a Morse code. You could send a Morse code down this line to somebody else. And that's quite interesting for a start. You've got to admit, say yes. 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 Right. Um, I think the best thing to do now is to uh, show you what I mean. Um, because we have been coming to the Green Gathering for quite a few years, and uh, we were obviously all in the same spot year after year, the tent changes a little bit. But uh, generally these lines that you pick up uh, flow from east to west. Um, and I know because I've been here on, I think, five occasions now. Not in, well, just for Green Gathering. But uh, I know for a fact where they are, basically. You know, and there's other dowsers that have been here, but you know, yeah, there are these energy lines. There's one that flows just the other side of the tent, uh, flown in this direction. It now um, goes through the arch. You know, the arch into the fairy lake. Okay, the first time that was built, the line was running slightly to one side of it. So in the same way I did with this, I just sort of took two rocks and I nudged it over, so it actually ran through the middle, which was. That was really nice. And then over the years, I've actually, now I knew where it is, I've shifted the arch over, so the arch always sits right in the middle of one. Um, because they run a certain, yeah, in this case, it's probably about 20 foot apart. Um, but yeah, I know there's another one, and there's another one that runs along, and it is just side, this side of the tent. So what I'd like you all to do, if you wouldn't mind, is just sort of come this way. Uh, okay, whichever way is, look, I say generally, and it, actually, it, that's true, that's a good point, actually. Generally, they do, but due to the, the formation, the geology that's under our feet, the depth of the soil, where the trees are, they do wave, okay? So they're not a straight line. And the... The responses that you do pick up from a line do fluctuate and move with the phases of the moon. Okay, so it's in a full moon, you might find that the lines are slightly further apart. Okay. Um, so would a growing tree push, push a line away from its root point? No, it will attract it. Attract it. You, um, at, again, Mount Edgecombe, the, the whole thing, there was two lines of trees, and these two lines were on either side of the trees. Um, so what I'm going to do... Oh. Now, what, what I'd like you all to do, basically, is just sort of... Basically, if you come closer, and I'll start over here, and then you can all see, but you do actually have to wiggle. So, a little bit of shuffling. This is not your average demonstration. So, basically, last time I did a talk in here, we had to tent the other way round. Uh, and we were running camera. this way. So, all I did then was I basically, I with two rocks, I pushed the line into the tent, um, which so it's basically running over here, so I moved into the middle, so there you can see. Because we now have a square tent, uh, and we've got a different tent, um, this time, uh, <coughs> I'll have to show you. So all I'm looking for, and with dowsing rods, the way they work is that they respond again to, we have a frequency, when we, if you're looking for something, um, if you're looking for water, water has a certain vibrational frequency, and the rods will respond to that frequency. Um, the dowsing has been used for thousands of years, um, up until, well, they still use it, uh, even the water board still use dowsing rods. The American Army used dowsing rods, but lots of oil companies. Lots of oil companies, again, use dowsing rods. The Cornish miners defined the mineral seams. Um, used to take uh, the original gas rods before the, the copper ones that we use these days uh, was a forked stick so they get a forked stick traditionally hazel 
with a little bowl on the end, into that bowl they would put everything apart from what they were looking for. So if they're looking for gold, they would put in uh, tin, iron, put that into the bowl and the rod would flip when they looked for gold. So I'm looking for telluric currents and as I walk along, okay, I get a response from the rods when I get to here. And if I carry on, and I go response rods to here, I'm going to go all the way out down this line, all the way out the tent, and I get a response from the middle. To start things off, just to show you that you can move the lines, uh, you can all go and sit down again now. So you have a line running across. Um, I came in now really carefully at the beginning, placed this rock. Um, I've just realised that my sparkly toes are now on the camera, which a potential be, so we'll love that bit. So I've placed that rock on one side of the line, and I've got another rock here, and I'm just going to shut it down. Now when I built the stone circle at Fairy Fest uh, about a month ago, because it was a full size stone circle, um, to move the rocks around, um, again it was the estate manager driving the tractor, Dragging and literally, rather than picking rocks up and putting them in the ground, makes it a bit easier. Um, and he was brilliant. Uh, we had 16 stones to put in, and I had to drag them on the back of the tractor uh, to actually drag them around to create what we could do. But the point I'm getting to is when you move a rock, the moment you pick it up, you lose whatever. It's like Cat's Cradle. Right? Got, everybody know Cat Cradle? Cat's Cradle? Yeah. Yeah. Right, um, if you drop a finger, you're going to lose the pattern on. So in the process of this chap dragging rocks around, um, at one point, the rock bounced off the ground, and we all went around the gals and rods again, and you can see it's gone back to its original form. So we really carefully had to drag the stone around. I had a little crew that came with me to help me build that, because uh, we only had a few days, it was 10 of us I went down to do it. And a couple of friends of mine that had never doused before, um, I explained the basics and what to look for. Uh, and they, they would find a response, they would get a response on there with the dowsing rods, you know, with the hill inside and all the proper spots and all of Then what I would do, as I would start to, to create and to build the surface, all of a sudden, and they, okay, they didn't understand exactly what was going on and what I was doing, um, but all of a sudden they wouldn't get a response, they'd find it somewhere else, and they're like, you know, whatever you are doing, you are doing something. You, know, you are actually doing this. Like something is happening. So the line is running down here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move this paint to the line. And all I'm going to do is very carefully just to push the rock in. So as I push, and we'll find out what happens in a minute, and I'm going to take it to there to start with, just because it's nice and easy, and I don't have to push it that far. So, we had a line that was running down the side of the tent. You all watched how my rods gave a response. And again, I've still got a line running, maybe. But then, if I step over here, and I go, and I'm looking for the same line, and it's, it's just, it's not there. I walk down, all of a sudden it's here. So I'm now, there was the line here, and now it's over here. So I'm now getting a response here. If I step round to the front, I'm getting a response here. So the line has gone around the rock in a little sort of effectively like a little L shape. So where it was running over there, is now looping around the rock and going over to here. Callum, if you wouldn't mind doing me a little favour. Yeah. Okay. So let me just, if you'd like, in moments, just to pick that rock up in a moment. Okay, so at the moment I've got a response here. I walk away, there isn't. Come back, it's here. So the line is following here. Now all I'm going to do, I've got no response from, oh, sorry about that. I've got no response from the rods again until I reach over to this position. All I'm going to do, I'm going to just going to stand here, and um, Callum, if you wouldn't mind picking the rock up, just what? And the line comes back. So we're going to, what we're going to do is 
start that little process again. Thank you, Callum. Round of applause for Callum. Right. right, so all I'm going to do, I'm going to take the light. Have you all, have you all seen and got what we've said so far? Yeah. Okay, that's near enough. Right. How far does it affect the line before it then goes back on? Sorry? How far when yeah, you move the line like that? It will. Ten feet or ten miles. It will like a, like again like a guitar string. It will net the whole thing. The whole planet is an. It, it, like our energetic system wants to be. It wants to keep it even. So if something is slightly out, it will naturally just pull it back in. So if I if I left it like that, within by the end of the tent it probably would have pulled itself back together. Okay, because the other lines next to it, again, would have moved in. So, so what, why did that end of the line go leg? It went problem. around. Well, let me show you again. Because you had, you had a rock anchoring that end? Yeah. The whole point is the line is anchored by this rock. This rock is the anchoring rock. It keeps the line so I know that the line is here. Okay? If I move that rock out the way, and I just took one rock, and I pulled one rock across the line, it would end up in a really long, curvy shape. Okay. Um, so all I'm going to do is I'm going to take the line that's in here, and again, I'll, actually I'll walk through this way to see. All right. But the line that's in here, that's running down this side. Okay. Um, if I move the rock, and all of those push it along the ground, and we're going to go to the middle, and then I'll show you something else. Oh, and the only reason I'm doing this basically is so that um, I've got a line that's basically um, in front of me. So if I show you with the rods again. Right. So as I, the reason I do this, all right, um, is to basically, is to clear whatever, anything that's in there. Um, and it's just I know I'm starting to sort of fresh set of rods. I am looking for generic currents. Okay? And again, I've got no response. And the thing is, I just have my rods. So I'll get a response here, and I get a response at the front. Okay, and I walk here, no response again. And I can just walk around actually all over. You know, and it's you know, nothing there, and then all of a sudden, running right through the middle. Line. But the reason is I've got a line in front of me, which is what I wanted. Um, over the years, um, energy lines have been represented for thousands and thousands of years um, with snakes, serpents, dragons, and there has always been um, two polarities, you know, whether it be a positive or a negative, but there's always two polarities. In the same way that we have two polarities, we have a positive and negative, um, and it's about, for us as, as humans in this day, it's about balancing those you know we've all got good bits bad bits and it's about balancing that and creating that sense of center in yourself in the slideshow which because i'm not going to use the slides anymore just unless you want to have a good look through at the end because they are a brilliant selection of slides but in the slideshow um i've got about 15 20 odd representations from thousands of years ago some of them of coiled and twisting serpents. Um, when we went down to Fairy Fest, um, I went down there with, yes, with the intention of building a stone circle. Uh, and I knew, and again I'm going to go back to the floor, because uh, I can draw easy on the floor and you can hopefully it'll make it more sense. But there was, uh, and I will, I'm going to call them Nick the estate manager, I said yes, there's two ley lines running around. Um, we all now know what the difference is between the two. Uh, what we had was, uh, and Stuart, again, the chap that I work with, went around, uh, and there was a, there is a Bronze Age burial mound that's on the site, um, and Stuart said, yeah, there's an energy line that it comes, it coils, you know, around the burial mound, um, and he told me about one of the lines. What he didn't do um, is tell me about the other one. So he didn't tell me about that. He drew me a map, but didn't put the other one in. Um, uh, after I'd then gone and had a little look, 
Um, and I found out there was another one running on the other side. And then I phoned him up and said, you didn't tell me about that? He said, yeah, of course I didn't. I didn't tell you about that because then we would both know that we'd both found the same thing. And independently, Nick, the estate manager, he also he had then said, yes, there are, there's these two uh, ley lines that were running through the park. Um, <coughs> so what we did, um, the first thing was they were running uh, on, on basically either side uh, of the tree line. So the first thing we did was, because it was about a good sort of 60 odd foot apart, uh, was to actually uh, pull them down into the middle. So uh, we actually had them then running, um, they're running about 20 foot apart uh, to start with. Um, our energetic system in with its twin polarities um, is quite often represented by a Merkur bar, uh, which is basically two um, two pyramids, one of the one of them inverted, that are linked together and they spin, they counter rotate. So one spins one way, one spins the other way. Um, with a man, they spin in one direction, and with a woman, they spin in the other direction. Uh, um, I, the, when you take the flower of life symbol, um, which is one of those symbols that has been carved onto uh, various ancient monuments throughout the world, um, and you break it down, um, you get to what's called the seed of life, which is basically seven circles. If you then turn those seven circles into a three-dimensional solid, you then get the Merkur bar shape. So that's why we use the Merkur bar. What's it called, Steve? Sorry? It's called a Merkur bar. Merkur bar. Sorry? Star tetrahedron. Or a star tetrahedron. Uh, to call it by its proper name, thank you, Nolan, at the back. But yeah, star tetrahedron. Um, I, in, what I'm trying to find out is we used to know how to, we used to do things with these lines. We used to bring them together. Um, we used to somehow do something with the natural electromagnetic field that we live on. Um, I want to find out what. I want to find out what we used to do. Um, so we had, we had the two lines, I brought them together. The first two stones, the line, actually I can use these to illustrate with. Right, we had two stones on one side. Okay, so I bought, by again pushing the line down. I bought the line down, so it was a lot closer together. I then took two rocks, and I pushed the first rock through to there, and I pushed the second rock through to this side. So I then, basically, I created a triangle. I then went the other side, and did it the other way round. Um, if, when I made the second triangle, if I'd, if I'd pushed, if I just carried on pushing the rocks around, because the lines will move out of the way and move away from the rocks, um, to form this second triangle of the Merkabar, which overlaps the first, they link together, I would have, if I'd just pushed the rocks around, I just would have moved the lines. Now I wanted them to interlink. So again, I went back to the pins, and all I did was I had a line, part of the triangle, I'll use it there because it makes it easier for me to describe it to you. So as I was moved, pushing the line through, I created the little box and I pushed the line through, I anchored it in with a stone, I then lifted the pins out, and then did the same with the other side. So I had to do it basically three times to get the second triangle overlaid with the first. Uh, because I did have, then have spare rocks, I now know this was absolutely superfluous in, in the end. But because I had spare rocks, what I then did uh, was I took the lines that are on either side and I, I bent them around to the middle. Now at that point, originally, and I had other people douse this as well, which makes it even more fun. You had the two energy lines running on either side and then all of a sudden you've got these two energy lines but they're right close together running sort of effectively next to each other about four foot apart, two stones either side, a bubble and the lines running either side. So on either end you can see where they, they've been moved together. I then bent them back again, so I went all the way in, all the way out, okay, and again the lines then moved out. So we had a, a Merkabar in the middle, 
fantastic festival, really enjoyed it. It's one of the most amazing, Three Wishes Fairy Festival is an amazing little festival. And the reason is, it's one that everybody dresses up. I mean, there is serious fairies and pixies and amazing costumes. You get theatre companies coming down from London and all sorts of it. It's an amazing little festival. Some of you have been. There are a couple of people in this room that actually helped me build that sort of stone circle. So, you know. so um, it is council land, uh, and it's also owned, it's owned by two different councils and the family, and they've all got this sort of joint thing. So the whole point was, uh, at that point, um, we didn't know whether or not we could keep the circle. Um, the festival themselves decided they wanted to keep the circle in the stones. Um, we weren't allowed uh, to actually leave the stones in the ground because <coughs> the farmer uses it for sheep grazing. Uh, but the festival bought the stones. We had to take the stones out, put them aside of the wood. Um, that was about a month and a half ago. I found out about three days ago. If we'd waited about another hour, we could have <laughs> left them all in. Now, considering it was summer solstice on that day when I was taking them out, it was like, ah! but yeah, we had found out we can leave them in. So we go back next year and do, it will be another circle for them. Uh, it will be left there. But, and I've got all goosebumpsly at this point, um, because we had to take the stones out um, and put them all to one side, and obviously then I went again in with the dowsing rods on to take them all out. And what I found <laughs> was that these two lines that originally ran on either side, basically now, uh, basically curved in, came into the middle, and they'd linked. So they'd, jo they'd literally linked together like that, so that you could come in like that, so all the responses were there, and they had actually linked, and I joined them together. And I burst into tears, and I thought, you know, one thing that I thought was a complete disaster, the stones were coming out, actually, for me, to learn how to link lines together, like we used to link lines together thousands of years ago, was phenomenal. When I started looking at all of this about five or six years ago, it was like, oh my God, I've got this new discovery, and it's amazing. Um, for the first few years, I avoided any type of book about dowsing or anything because I really didn't want to get any, I didn't want to get influenced by something that somebody had then subsequently written. Um, I started working closely uh, with a lady called Ross Springer, um, who is actually here. She's an astrologer. Um, she was one of the first people I actually started talking to about, you know, I'm just finding out all these stuff that I don't quite understand and she just sort of nodded and said yeah that's about right Steve <laughs> and the reason she could say that with authority is that um, I know of two people and she's only she's one of them that was um, born with an ability to so she can see auric fields and she can see the auric fields on us trees plants the world she can see these energy lines she recommended that I read a book um, by Nigel Twin called Beyond the Far Horizon. And it's all about a dowser over in Ireland called Billy Gorn. Um, Billy, unfortunately, is, is way into his 90s now. Um, I haven't actually met him. I would love to meet him. Billy was born with the same ability. He's a farmer, lives up in Northern Ireland, uh, been on the family farm for generations. And he was just born with this ability to see. And he could, again, I started reading the book and as I was reading through it, all of a sudden I've seen pictures of, yes, you get a centre line with four lines running on either side. Schauberger's work with water currents. You've got energy lines flowing that way, it's the eddies that flow the other way, you create the eddies, you create the eddies. And he said the way that he sees them out in the fields is you have a centre line that, and there is a height to them. So you, you have a centre line, which can be anything from sort of 20 to sort of 50 odd foot high, and the lines on the other side are slightly lower, slightly lower, slightly lower, and then there's a pause, and then you get the next set of lines, and the next set of lines, and the next set of lines. And I do read his book. He's one of the most, he's, um, he did write um, um, a very good book. You can get from the British Society for Dowsers, all about, it's an encyclopedia of terms, trying to, again, to lay out all these, all these different words and way of explaining how earth energies and how, how geomancy works. Um, for me, it was, it was, it was amazing, because it was like somebody else completely independent of me, that I, I, basically I'd never heard of before, is all of a sudden confirming all the little things that I'd learned over the last few years. 
Um, and it inspired me. You know, he's one of the main people uh, that inspired me to carry on trying to understand. Um, sorry? Billy Gorn. G A W N. And the book is Beyond the Far Horizon, and that's by Nigel Twin. Um, these energy lines have been used for thousands of years, and but all of a sudden now, in our modern society, um, there's no information, there's no knowledge about how, how they worked and what we used to do. Um, it's not taught anywhere, you know. And in the process of looking, um, and again, with the slideshow, all the different images um, of how energy lines have been represented, um, and if you go back to um, places like Nauth over in Ireland, um, with all the rock glyphs, you've all got spirals, you've got lines flowing in certain directions. If you go to um, uh, Gra Gravinus, uh, which is over in France, you've got the same. Um, the Swastika Stone is a really, it's a, again, a very famous stone up in uh, North, Northumberland, I believe, uh, where again you have uh, eight dots arranged and you have a line that effectively follows a swastika direction. Um, I've made that. <laughs> you see, it's very, actually very simple to make. You put four stones in the middle, okay, um, with one line and you basically you pull it out to make that shape. Um, so you can actually you can make all kinds of different, effectively patterns in, in the same way that I made the Merkle bar. We, when I first started this, I, I, because I do come from a scientific background, both my parents are scientists, um, or were scientists, they've retired now. Um, I, I was approaching it in the sense of, I had all these series of experiments that I wanted to do. You know, what, what would happen if you used, actually one of the, and I still haven't done this yet, but years ago, the first thing that I was really intrigued about was um, what happens when you use different rocks? You know, if you put a different rock on the line, you know, will the line move a little bit more than, say, would, would a, a limestone make a line move more than a, than a granite piece of rock? Um, I still haven't actually explored that. You know, it's taken me five or six years to get to this point. But for the first few years, I kept trying different things. Um, there is a wonderful little demonstration. I might even do it this afternoon if I've got time and I'll just leave it out there. I did this a few years ago here as well. If you have one energy line flowing in one direction and the one next bit flowing in the other direction, if you do the same thing with the rocks, two rocks on one side, but on this case you push them both together. When you get to the middle of that, um, you've basically got one flowing one way and one flowing the other way, okay, which is going to make it rotate. When you stand with the lines that close together to you, and I was doing this a few years ago, so come and stand in the middle of that, and you stand in the middle of that, and you would find yourself turning and spinning. And we did this with a few people out there, and what we found out, the really interesting part, was that the men would spin in one direction, and the women would spin in the other direction. So I had all these little series of experiments that I was doing. Whenever I could get access to a little bit of field to, to do something with, I did. And I was offered down in Dartmoor um, a field or it's actually three fields together um, that a friend of mine had she said look you can do whatever you like and I, I went out there and I there was there was no lines across the field and there was a it was an old gate post all right it wasn't a standing stone it was a gate post you know uh, carved square but it was a stone gate post there was then 12 lines okay um, a stone wall and a little gate going through and then again no lines again these are some of the original field boundaries uh, from Donkey. The original stone walls were from Saxon times on Dartmoor. And in the process, I mean, these days we use tractors, but in the process of clearing a field, ready for planting, putting crops on it, obviously it's, there's loads of rocks, you know, and you push and pull and carry the rocks out of the way. So I had no lines. I would think that the reason there was no lines across that little bit was basically because as you pull the rocks away to the side to create the stone wall, 
you therefore move the rocks out of the way. Because this was right on the edge of Dartmoor, and literally there, were, there was a stone wall and then the wilds of Dartmoor, on the outside we had nine lines, again a centre line before either side, um, and they flowed down to one side of the field, but in this section there was 12 lines. I got home and I thought, right, I've got this whole field to play with, what can I do? And I was thinking about it and I realised that those 12, well, I, when I was out there, I had nine. When I was in here, I had 12 with these gaps on either side. And I went back and I walked across them and they were squashed. They were squashed together. They were sort of even, even, even squashed and even out. And I thought, well, to me, because of our influence on, on this field over the years, because of the way that we'd moved things, that it, I, all I would do is I moved, basically I found the centre line, and there was seven on one side, five on the other, and I took the three that were spare, and I just basically moved them out of the way. And I put them down, just literally down to one edge, so I evened all the rest of them out. The lady whose field it was, that during the summer she had to fence off that little middle section because the grass, for some reason, grew very slightly too sweet, which therefore causes, I still haven't got the name in my head yet, there is a, a, a fungal type of problem that horse can get on their feet with when the grass is too sweet. And during the summer months you couldn't let the horse um, basically do anything on that bit because it wasn't allowed to eat the grass. Um, a year later and the horse is and can eat that grass. So all I did was I moved the lines over, I didn't do anything else because it didn't, it didn't feel right to do anything else. I'd done what I needed to do right there was to stop this little squash bit um, and now the horse can eat all over the field. Uh, the difference was that when I first started I felt like a, a, a medieval butcher, effectively, a medieval surgeon, hacking, because it is exactly like our system, you know, our veins, our arteries, our energetic system, you know, the earth, our planet has the same. And, and I was being a butcher, and I stopped. And I stopped because I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was involved with. And the moment I actually did something just to, I could see what was wrong and I did what I thought was right and it helped, you know, in the end it helped the horse, you know. And I realised that I, was, I wasn't actually working alone because slowly over time I'd learnt effectively a new alphabet. You have to learn, you learn shapes of letters, you know, how those letters go together to make an alphabet, how those individual letters can then make a word, how a word makes a sentence. And you can start to recognise, just through looking at the land, um, how, how these lines um, flow together. And you start to receive information. You start to enter, I can now, I have a dialogue um, with our planet. And it's like, it's, you, you've, when you learn to talk to it, you, and it talks back. Um, if you listen to trees, you can hear trees. Trees talk to you. Um, the sea talks to you. That was quite an amazing experience, and that was only recently. Um, I've had some amazing changes recently where I, I am feeling very clean and clear, and the sea is, a, a, because it's water, and the water is conscious, same way everything is conscious, um, but it's a huge volume of, of effectively a sound. Whereas, obviously, with a tree, especially bigger, older trees, uh, ask, just ask, ask, go and talk to a tree, go and sit under a tree and hold a tree, and just ask if it's got anything to tell. Emperors uh, and pharaohs throughout history stand and en enter these different realms. Um, I was lucky enough to spend some time with an ayahuasca shaman for a few years, and. I could, have, I could have had ayahuasca at any point. Um, I chose not to because I believe we can access and understand all of this without, without the use of psychedelics. Um, for me that works really well because it keeps my system nice and clean and I like that. Um,
Any questions? It did work for one person, it didn't work for another, or you're getting yeah, lots and lots of responses all over. Like the, if, you, if anybody picks up a set of dowsing rods and you walk around with a set of dowsing rods, just thinking, am I holding a set of dowsing rods? Those rods, haven't they, they're not the minerals in the ground, um, energy lines. If you're looking for water, and you specify you're looking for water, you will find water. If you're looking for something else, you'll find something else. An ex-girlfriend of mine, when I taught her to dowse, the first we were in a field near Glastonbury, and um, I found that she said, oh, Steve, I'm getting a response, getting a response to something here. And then I found out she was looking for gold. And I just thought that was really the reason she's an ex-girlfriend. But yeah, she could <laughs> roll some gold down there. Um, if you do go out and you want to find things, you're out in the field, if you want to try and find different things, if you are looking for, say, if you do choose gold, for instance, um, if you want to find out how deep it is, you can use what's called Bishop's Rule. Uh, and Bishop's Rule, was, again, was developed, I'm not going to name who developed it because I can't quite remember, but it was developed by, and it's used now by the British Society for Dowsers. Uh, and again, Google it, Bishop's Rule. And it's basically where you, if you, um, if you want to find out, say, the height of an energy line or the depth of water, um, they're basically, uh, you've got a response to where the water is, uh, and you take paces to either one side or the other. So if you take six paces, it's six metres down if you're looking for water. So again, basically we did this and we found out about three metres down, supposedly, yeah, there'll be a lump of gold under that spot. And at some point, because it's my friend's field, I will go and dig it up and have a look. Does that? Well, yeah, I just wondered why it didn't work for them, that's all. Was it because they didn't have in their mind that they were looking for something? I think so. Specific? I think so. And I think some people, so there had is had a that sensitivity. Minds, it would have worked. Yeah, yeah, and I think not, I think everybody can douse. But I think you've, you've got to practice it. Yeah. I didn't practice it, but I picked it up. Yeah. I know. I know. It's amazing because you go, oh, like really explain about my, my two it friends that never doused before in their life. They've, they've got these responses, yeah. and then I moved a rock, and they haven't got responses. So, whatever I'm doing, they then knew something is, you are doing something. So, there is a way to. I think you've got to believe it's going to work for it to work. If you're blocking it mentally, it's not Yeah, I didn't believe or not believe. Yeah. Well, you're open to it. I don't, but some, yeah, some, people, some, people, some people can. There are people that can douse with their hands. Yeah. You know, um, my partner is, is a very sensitive, she has always been a very sensitive woman, and she can actually feel energy lines with her hands. Her body can feel them. She can walk into them. Um, just outside Glastonbury, uh, on the way to Pilton, where Glastonbury Festival is, um, we were walking down the road, just, just the other side, and all of a sudden there is, as you walk down the road, it's like a river that you can feel. And we walked into it, I just wandered through. But she was like, bloody hell, can you feel that? And then as I concentrated a little bit more, you can feel it, and it's like this eight, ten foot wide of energy, which actually does lead me on to something that has just intrigued me recently. It was the fact that, again, um, a few months ago, I was living just out, well, I've moved since, but I was living just outside Glastonbury. And I'd always assumed at that point that these energy lines, when you're out in the open field and things, were everywhere, you know, because out in the big wide spaces. Because we were just outside the town, I couldn't, I couldn't find anything. I went right away around the house, right around the little local fields around me, and I still couldn't find anything. So I've now realised they're not everywhere. Okay, and if they're not somewhere then due to some intervention and it might have been from thousands of years ago right up to the present day um, they have actually been moved so they've been moved in so I'm one I'm now wondering if the fact that there is a, a Mike, the Michael and Mary line that does run through down through Glastonbury Tour and the Mary line does tend to meander a little bit more and it does go through Pilton uh, I'm just wondering if that is a condensed amount of lines um, that have been squashed together which makes a bigger line which everybody can then pick up because obviously the main centre line you'll get a stronger response from the lines on either side. Next question. See you later my friend. Any questions? I've got another one. So this 
Oh yeah, they do go down about six to eight foot. But if they were naturally underneath, they flow in the top, uh, the top strata, the top subsoil. So okay. they go, but they do go down about six to eight so foot. So if there was naturally a stone that naturally just in the ground, yeah. and it was within that bit of the top, it was divert. Or if it's been there long enough, it will just eventually just meander through. But it has to be there a long time. But it, they will go round rocks. But the thing is, they get right, if you imagine that you've got a rock, and it will get right up to it, and very small little fluctuation. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, I've got two questions, actually. Right. So, okay, Ooh. energy lines, ley lines. Yeah. Uh, why do they go through sacred sites, or why do people do sacred stuff on them? What, what is the influence of them? Um, Because sacred sites, especially the stone circle, is about, I think it's almost as high as about 90% of stone circles that have been built in the UK have been built on what's called a blind spring. So it's where the water is basically, you've got, uh, the water will flow under the rocks and you get a blind spring where it will actually come up. When people are looking to drill wells, Okay, they're looking for the blind spring because that keeps the, the well filled up. <coughs> I don't know why stone circles were placed on blind springs, but they, they generally were. Um, and again, this is, this, is, this is just what I believe. I believe that in the same way that back at Stanton Druid, I mentioned a line can be coiled around a rock and it went onto another rock and we coiled around the rock. I was out uh, a few months ago over in Ireland, a place called Tamuni Hills, um, and again, it's, Tamuni Hills was amazing. It's a, it's a massive site. Um, it hasn't been archaeologically explored because it's over a huge area. Uh, I was told about it to, to go and have a look. It's completely untouched. And, and what I found there, and again, was basically where we had a line that came up to a stone. It coiled up and up and up and up on the stone and then it stopped. And the stone next to it had again the same thing, but the line um, was going the other way round. So it came in on this side, but the other one came in on, on look that. At that. If you go, if you look at the roll right stones and you look at the original work of Dennis Wheatley, uh, his daughter Maria is now carrying on his work. When he was doing, studying the roll right stones, um, again, they would find coils of energy, bands going up the rocks. We operate our, our natural uh, frequency that we as humans vibrate at through, um, through meditation, uh, through, again, TV. Um, uh, we can alter our electromagnetic vibration. So you can go from sort of alpha to beta, um, theta, um, and you can, you can raise your frequency. So you, basically you can effectively speed yourself up a little bit. If you have a modern electrical circuit, if you take a wire and you make a coil, you will actually, you will increase, that's exactly how capacitors work, to bump up voltages. You make a coil, you wrap it up. So we have the, this energetic field. Uh, there is the Schumann resonances, which is, this is the Earth's vibration. So it starts about 7.82. Um, they go all the way up to about in the early, I think it's about 42, but there's, there's about, I think there's seven different peaks basically. It has been graphed. If you look up the US Geological Society, uh, they've actually got graphs of these Schumann resonances and the wave they create over a 24 hour period. When you increase your um, electromagnetic field and you take yourself up into the higher vibrations, up into the theta waves um, you can expand your consciousness and you can then move into uh, other dimensions and higher higher places of being if you take that one stage further you can astrally project uh, right the way out out into the universe so why thousands of years ago did we take energy lines and coil them around rocks and coil them back down rocks? 
we did this for some reason. We didn't have the modern power requirements of today. So in exactly the same way that a simple electro, uh, electric circuit works that we all use all the time, I think that we were using these machines to, uh, to expand our consciousness as a collective. So people could walk into that ceremonial sacred space and again <coughs> overlaying that with the use of drumming and chanting could actually easily access those, those higher realms of consciousness. To take things onto another level throughout thousands of years in all of our um, historic literature there has always been images that we see of, of angels and dragons and fairies and we have gods that live in the sky um, and they are all um, they're all depicted with wings if I was a, a medieval illustrator and somebody was explaining to me a legend about people that could fly and you know, horses that could fly and fairies that could fly I would I wouldn't be able to comprehend them in my head as real and I would draw wings on them because of work of the people like Billy Gorn in, in helping to understand the, the three-dimensional sense of these lines, that they are they're coming out of the earth. We have the earth's magnetic field. There is, there is we think, a, 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 an iron molten ball in the middle of our planet that creates our magnetic field. Uh, and as the planet spins, it sends that magnetic field out of the earth. The picture we all have in our minds is of basically that we can all remember from school is where you've got the planet and just like you put a bar magnet on you've got lines that go all the way up down and all the way up the bottom we all remember that and again if you go to the US Geological Society the overall picture over the whole planet and you've got to imagine this is like right the way around the planet is huge but when you take that down to a smaller scale uh, and again, they've got maps of this. When you measure the magnetic field that's coming out, um, it does tend to form itself into uh, a grid-like pattern. So, it, and it does depend on the geological features. But so there is this magnetic field that's coming out of the planet. So it's coming up effectively from where we are here. Because our planet is water-based, and we're spinning around this vacuum vacuum uh, at thousands of miles an hour, um, that does create around our entire atmosphere an, uh, an electrostatic field. Okay, So the electrostatic field up there wants to get here, it wants to ground itself out, which is why we have thunder, why we have lightning, because it's grounding itself out, which is pushing down. So the magnetic field is going out and the electrostatic field is coming in. It may be that through the process of creating these machines and creating these, um, these basically power stations as such, that if enough coils are used around all of the rocks and they are all linked together in a certain way, that that may have an influence because the magnetic field, I can influence the magnetic field. I can move lines around, so I can influence that magnetic field coming out. That may have an influence on the electrostatic field coming down, in which case the magnetic field is pushing up. So it may be that things can then, yes, start to levitate, start to float, start to fly, like all the old illustrations used to show us. Exactly. Exactly. So one influences the other. I have got a couple of minutes left. So the first thing I'd like to say is thank you ever so much for listening. The second thing, and this kind of changed my perception on how we actually live as a, as a society these days. In all the ancient texts, the ancient glyphs, when energy, earth energies and are represented, uh, and again, it's by coiled serpents, you know, kundalini, yin-yang. 
and I was, I was looking up at the caduceus symbol, which is basically a rod with two coiled serpents going up either side. And you can see this in all, all really. The thing that really struck me in, when I typed in caduceuses, and I was looking at caduceus, all of a sudden a bishop's crozier came up. And over the thousands of years, um, at some point in our history, for every single member of the Christian church, all the bishops, to have these croziers, that are these caduceuses, with these twin coiled serpents going up them. At some point, the church took control over these power lines, effectively, and the knowledge was lost. I am not a conspiracy theorist. I don't do that at all. I, I try to represent what I, what I find out. And I found that out uh, recently, a few months ago. And so this knowledge is out there. You know, it is out there, but it has been taken away from us for some reason. That reason possibly might be that we can affect our gravitational field. Many years ago here, the first time I ever built an arch over in the Fairy Glade, I built a big arch out of wood. And in between all of the joints in the, in the wood, I put a stone and I had stones going up over the arch. I built two arches in the second arch, which is about 50 foot away. I did the same thing with stones going up around the arch. I was sitting around the campfire. Um, I don't drink, don't take drugs. I have, you know, so I wasn't remotely off my head or anything like that. And I sat there and I watched this hole appear. And it was like about the size of a ping pong ball. And I could see through it. And it was right in front of me and I could see through it. And I sat there and I looked at it. And I got up and I went round the side and it disappeared. And I went round the back and it disappeared. And I still, I just, and I went round the front, it was there. It was there for about two minutes. I was so like gobsmacked, I didn't go up and poke my finger <laughs> in it or anything like that. But somehow, in the process of, if you imagine that when you put a rock on the line, it moves around the line, and I had rocks going all the way up with a line running through the middle. So this whole thing was basically squashed at all sides. And again, in two different places, something, something appeared in the middle. Something was there, something like a pinprick in a balloon was there. There are other dimensions that exist. There are our perception of what we can see is very, very limited as humans. Uh, animals have a far greater range of different perceptions of what they can see. Um, there are people that regularly see fairies. They are there that live out in the forests, in the woods. Um, I would like to hope over the years um, I can slowly start to unravel the mysteries and, and unravel and try and understand what I've found out so far and slowly in time and again through and please do join Machines of the Ancients it's on Facebook um, yes yeah, good place to learn a few interesting things I started out to gather loads of people together but it's ended up turning out there's couple of thousand people a host of information about ancient technology is, well about how we're all trying to understand it is on there as well um, and I do hope within you know over my lifetime because I know for a fact that uh, as well as helping to arrange wonderful festivals for you all um, this is this is my passion this is what I'm interested in this is what what I'm trying to understand a little bit more and I hope in the end to expand my own mind and uh, at some point hopefully everybody else's so thank you ever so much for watching reason when I placed the stone on the line it went round in one direction and I turned it over it went round in the other is all to do with what's actually called a paleomagnetic signature um, all rocks uh, doesn't matter what type uh, whether they're sedimentary or igneous have a um, 
a very small uh, particles of metallic elements in them. So you get, you know, gold, iron, copper, you know, but very small amounts. And when the rocks are first formed, um, i.e. sort of when they're molten, now I'm talking millions of years ago, those particles align themselves to the magnetic north pole. Okay. Now, obviously, over millions of years, uh, with geology, the formations change. The, you know, when, when the rocks come out of the ground, um, they're not optically, all these little bits aren't facing the north. Um, and it's down, that creates a polarity in the stone. Um, the first stone circle um, that I helped to build, and I provided the rock for that, was at Sunrise Festival uh, four, I think it was about four, no, probably five years ago now. And I approached Sunrise because I had, I wanted to find out stuff. You know, oh, let's, let's get some rocks, let's build a stone circle. So I approached Sunrise and I said, look, I'd like to build you a temporary stone circle. Uh, I'll turn up with an articulated lorry, all the rocks, put them in, you have the festival and the quarry gets them back. But I went to the quarry um, just down the road from Bruton. Uh, Rob, I've worked with on numerous occasions subsequently now. Um, and I went to the quarry with a little compass um, and I watched, because these are sedimentary rocks, right? this is a, um, a sandstone that we used, and it's sedimentary. So it's, it's formed by layers and layers and layers that build up very slowly over time. So you haven't got all the volcanic processes with an igneous rock that makes, so that makes all the, you never know, they're not going to be facing magnetic north. But these, the rocks were coming out the cliff in sort of a horizontal direction, and it was north to south. And you could go in the dowsing rods, and at one end of the rock, the rods would flow to one direction, at the other end, it would flow to another. And if you turn the rock over that way, you'd get the opposite response. So I then realised that obviously, yes, there is a polarity uh, to the stones um, that we can actually detect uh, with the rods. Um, right. Like that. I then wondered um, if you had a line, um, whether or not you could move it. So I'll take, I'll use the same rock just for the sake of illustration, but I'll put the rock on one side of the line and I'll put two rocks on the other side of the line like that. Um, and I actually moved the line. Okay. So again, I got a response with the dowsing rods here and a response here, but when you go into the middle, you get no response until you actually get to the end. And you can trace it like that around. The really interesting part is, um, and I have before, and I will have some things to properly show you in a moment. Um, the interesting thing was that normally I'll get somebody else just to pick the rock up, and you pick the rock up, and at that point, the line springs back to its original position. So it's actually, it, it's like it's elasticated. Okay. Um, I think we'll have a slide. I'm a, yeah, we'll have a slide. Have a little bit of a slide. And they say copper pin. And all they do is literally if you've got a house like that and you want you've got a line running through the middle and you put a pin on one side of the house on the outside and a pin on the other um, and it grounds out the line um, and that's basically what sort of what they do so i did this and i took out these two lines that crossed i didn't say any i talked to my mother i didn't talk to my dad my dad's a scientist no interest whatsoever in dowsing or anything anything like this and uh about a week later um they started saying, my feet have really sorted themselves out, you know. And Mum and I laughed a lot. Uh, we did tell him a couple of years later and he still doesn't get it, but, you know, his feet stopped being hot. And um, it just, that was the start of me learning to explore how our, how our Earth's natural energy system worked. Um, in the process of looking around the house, I went out into the garden. Oh, let's find another inverted commas energy line. And uh, I found one that ran across the front of the garden. And I thought, so I tried, got the pins again, made some more, because they're only just, these are just bits of copper wire. Uh, I made the pins again, but this time I put them quite close together. 
an effectively made little gate. And what that meant was, if the line was running down here, if you went there where you doubt it was, you get a response of something was going on. And if you went that side, something's going on. And before you put the pins in, something's going on in the middle. And then you put the pins in, and you don't get a response in the middle. So the rods just go through. Um, two years ago, when I did a talk here, uh, right at the end, there was a German uh, scientist that came the other way. So it's got a diurnal characteristic, which means it goes one way during the day and the other way at night. And at that point, I googled diurnal characteristics. And um, all of a sudden, I found out that these energy lines, in inverted commas, actually had a name. They had been studied by science um, for the last at least, a, at least 150 years. They've been studying them. Um, and they're actually called telluric currents. Um, it is part of the Earth's electromagnetic field. Um, and they're basically um, very low voltage between one to one and a half volts. Um, and you can measure these with little voltmeters in the ground. Uh, the original Earth batteries um, that people like Nathan, well, Nathan Stubblefield invented them. Um, but the original Earth batteries were, again, you have two um, dissimilar metal probes in the ground uh, and you can pick up a very, very small uh, amount of voltage in, in that. Um, it was actually used uh, to help power the American railroad system uh, at first because all they needed is a tiny little amount of electricity. But then as, as modern electrics came in, Tesla, as most of you know, but probably invented the, well, did invent the, the AC motor. Um, so we weren't using direct current because obviously direct current will just kill you sort of thing, so AC is safe. So, uh, and then modern electrics came into being, and these, this tiny amount of effectively what became uh, useless power, uh, the, the research in it got left behind and because we moved into the modern age, uh, and so we went on. Um, who had a, a multi-wave oscillator, uh, which basically is a, it's about, it was about the size of a half a credit card. And um, this thing locks on to whatever electromagnetic signal isn't there, okay? So uh, uh, the great thing was right at the end of the talk and he pulled it out of his pocket and he just chucked it in the middle and it null and voided the pins. All right, it was brilliant. And so and I went through and then I got response as well. Um, at that point, I taught my mum to doubt. She was like, oh, you know. So effectively, you'd, you'd have a little gate that you could walk through. And then you take the pins out, and again, you get a response right away down the line. Just because I was interested, at that point, um, I took a rock. And if the line was running in front of me, I put the rock on the line, and I went round it, and all of a sudden, I found that the line would go actually around the rock, like that. I thought that's pretty cool. Um, the next bit is when it started to get a lot more interesting. And I picked the rock up and I turned the rock over and I put it on the other way up. Okay, now this rock isn't going to balance that way up, but you know what I'm saying. So I put the rock on the other way up and it went the other way around the rock. You put it that way up, it'll go one way around, turn it over and it'll go the other way around. It's like, ah. I then wondered, well, if, you got, if I'm getting a response of something in front of me, you know, this slight fluctuation, you know, energy line, um, if it had a direction. So I, I went in with the dowsing rods. Has it got a direction? And well, the rods all went to one side. And I thought, oh, and that's, that's interesting, but I didn't know any more than that. And um, what changed things for me was actually going out that night, and I asked the same question again, has it got a direction? And the rods went...